guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's 12 o'clock on a Sunday and it's time for a Q&A. For those of you that don't know, every Sunday at 12 o'clock, I take all the questions that have been asked throughout the week on the channel and I answer all of those questions. It's one of my favorite videos of the week because I get to answer a load of questions that I didn't even think about. So thank you for all the questions, keep them coming. If you have a question for next week, let me know in the video in the comments of this video down below and uh, let's get straight on with the first question. Right, so the first question is by Michael Boring. Hey, Michael. He says, great video, Craig. Thank you very much. Are you a fan of the jerks? And are there any other magic blogs or newsletters that you would recommend? Great question, Michael. Um, you know what? I am a fan of the jerks. I haven't read enough of his stuff. And I feel really bad about that because I feel like I should. But when you go onto his site, there is so much stuff that is written. It's almost like overwhelming. And at the moment, I'm really busy doing a lot of other stuff, especially coming up to Christmas and all the different virtual parties that we're trying to organize as a company. Uh, I'm very, very busy. But here's the thing. Every single time I go on his site, I get inspired and I, I, I binge a lot of the stuff that I read. I'll go in to read one particular thing and I'll end up reading, going back like three or four things and just keep going until Sarah screams at me because I've got to do something else and I should have done it 10 minutes ago, right? The problem is, I know he brings out a collection of, of like uh, his stuff every year and I always miss it because I always forget to go on his site. Um, it's not something that I regularly go and check and then I'll kind of think, oh, the jerks, and I'll go back and check it and I'll probably spend like an hour there. But I always miss the opportunity he gives people to buy his stuff. But yeah, I'm like a huge fan of his. I think that his thinking is very different to anyone I've seen and he deserves to have more recognition because he writes a blog and he hasn't like written a book that's available in all magic dealers. A lot of people don't know about him. He's very underground. I remember back in the day when he was the magic circle jerk, then he disappeared, then he came back and he basically spent his first incarnation just having to go at the magic circle, having to go at the magic cafe. Uh, and there was some very funny stuff he put out that back then. I really uh, found it amusing. But since he's come back, He's been really, really clever thinking. Like I'm talking about super clever thinking. I remember something he talked about a couple of years ago. And I remember reading it and going, oh my gosh. Uh, he had the idea of um, being out with somebody. I think he used the idea of being out on a date and you draw the uh, what your apartment looks like in all the different rooms. And you ask someone to kind of uh, uh, decide on the colors in the different room. And then when you go back to your apartment and they walk in there for the first time, all of the rooms are lit up in the color that they've actually decided on. And I remember reading that and going, damn, that's clever thinking. So yeah, he's a great guy. I don't think he's my biggest fan uh, because I've seen a couple of times he's referenced me on his site and uh, he's been less than complimentary, but I'm cool with that. You know, you can't love everybody. You can't, you know, I, I get that he doesn't like me. I'm, I'm very chalk and cheese. I'm very Marmite, uh, but I'm a big fan of him. I think he's great. I think magic needs more people like the jerks. I'd love to know who he is because he just goes by the name of Andy and I'm, I'm pretty Pretty sure he's not Darren Brown. I remember seeing the big reveal. Uh, but the fact that that video was done by Darren tells you the impact that he's having on the community. And I think it's great. And I want to see more stuff from him. And every year, it seems like he's deciding whether to carry on or not. I really hope he does carry on because uh, he's insightful. He's intelligent. And uh, I, I really like what he's, what he's all about. It's a good guy. Uh, regarding other stuff, uh, you know, I'm planning on doing a video at some point about what I think are the best resources uh, on the uh, on the on the internet and on YouTube and all the different places you can go to get free information, but. Um one thing that I would say straight away is Mark Leverage Magic. If you don't know Mark Leverage Magic, Mark Leverage is the uh, is the publisher of Magic Scene Magazine. Uh, he runs Magic uh, Mark Leverage Magic, who have been around for so many years. He used to run the British Close Up Symposium, uh, which is uh, which has got some amazing acts on over the years. Uh, he used to put out a lot of physical products, but now he just puts out electronic stuff. His Forever Flapping and I'm Still Flapping books on 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 gaffed envelopes are just amazing. He, he put out recently a, uh, a Cards Across that Andy Nyman did on his socials that just fooled the pants off me. Uh, Mark Leverage is great and every month he puts out a, a newsletter that you can read for free or you can pay a little bit of money and get access to the pro version with even more information. So go check out Mark Leverage Magic and get onto his mailing list. Uh, I'm going to do another video on this sort of stuff in the future but for now if you don't know guys check out The Jerks. I think it's thejerks.com and Mark Leverage Magic. Those are two guys that you cannot go wrong with. 
Okay, so the next question, the next question is by Mr. Harmon. And he says, only one question today. I'm actually gutted, dude. I really am. You've been asking questions every single Q&A and you've only come up with one this week. Don't worry about it. I won't feel upset. Uh, one question this week. What's your favourite Fool's performance apart from Tom Stone? Great question. My gosh, there's so many great Fool's performances. I think the thing about put Fool's is that you have to be a good act to go on there. You know, I don't think they're going to allow, um, you know, somebody who hasn't got a clue what they're doing to go onto the program. So I think everyone's of a really high quality. And I do plan on putting a video together of my top 10 favourite Fool's performances. However, to give you a bit of a sneak peek, some of the stuff I like. Okay, so first of all, John Archer, when he did his Blank Knight effect on season one of Fool Us, I was blown away. It was funny, it was engaging, it got everybody on his side, and it fooled the pants off me. It was, um, honestly, it was so good. Um, uh, Blank Knight was one of my favourite performances on there. I also like uh, Pitt Hartling. Pitt Hartling was really good, I think he was a couple of seasons ago. Uh, that was another card trick that just completely fooled me. Um, also on season one, or it might have been season two, Ali Cook. Now, I haven't seen his second performance yet. I, uh, I hope to watch it at some point. I've, I've been told it's really good. But his first performance was brilliant, where he made the duck and the chicken's head change places. And what I loved about it from a stage point of view was the choreography, the music, everything had a purpose. It was just a beautiful routine to watch. I really liked Ali's performance there. Um, the latest season, there is a quick change artist, uh, a lady who does a quick change thing that just blew me away. Now, to give you some frame of reference here, I do quick change, not myself personally, but in my illusion act, I have girls that, you know, change their costumes a few different times. So I understand the concept of quick change. And my issue with a complete quick change act is normally they come out like really fat and then they end up getting thinner and thinner and thinner until the end of the act, right? This girl came out and just blew my mind. She was doing quick change with no cover. She was slowly changing the clothes. Everything I knew about quick change was literally taken sideways and kicked out the front door. It is probably the best Fool's performance I've ever seen. It was amazing. Obviously, you talked about Tom Stone. I loved it so much, I bought the prop. Um, oh, and I'll tell you what. Uh, I think it was Michael Kent. Let me know in the comments. I could be wrong. Uh, but a few seasons ago, uh, Michael Kent, maybe, I don't know, did a, um, a, a um, multiplying bottles routine. And I remember watching that and it was so funny. It was such a great routine to, somebody, to see somebody take a prop that everybody overlooks and just kill an entire room with it. Man, that was a masterclass. That was a masterclass. I remember watching that and immediately going and finding my multiplying bottle set and reworking on it because I thought it was so good. It had such an impact on me. Um, so that was a fantastic routine as well. I'm going to do a video on this in the future, but there's some of the foolish routines that I really like. But let me know down below, guys, what's your favorite foolish, uh, foolish performance? I'd love to know. Okay, so the next question is by Paul Smith. Hey, Paul. Uh, he says, one for the Sunday, Craig. Well, it's Sunday, so let's go for it. What's your favourite Sankey DVD or effect? Guys, you're asking me questions that I'm planning on doing videos on. I'm planning on doing a video on my top 10 favourite Sankey tricks because he's done so many. If I had to say my favourite Sankey product, it would have to be a set of three books from uh, Vanishing Ink because there is so much material on there. It's his marketed stuff, it's his stuff he's put on DVDs and it's all in book form and I can just pick it up and I can read it. When I'm doing virtual shows, right, I've got the three sets of books by the side of where I film my virtual shows. And normally it's like a 10 or 15 minute wait beforehand. So I'm just sitting off camera with the camera switched off, waiting for everyone to arrive. And I'm just kind of reading books and I'm just reading the Sankey stuff. And inevitably I'll probably find something else that's completely different. Uh, I, love, I love his books. If you want to make a specific product, one of my favorite Sankey tricks of all time is one that a lot of people don't talk about, which is Three Ring Circus. I'm a big fan of the linking rings, and he came up with this really neat idea of having three key fobs link themselves in so many different ways. Um, more people should do that because it's so good. It is such a great thing. Uh, it really is. Uh, the, the Three Ring Circus is, is amazing to watch. Uh, if you haven't got one, go pick it up. I think it's still available. Uh, I also like, um, he does the thing with a key and a coin. I can't remember the name of it. Maybe you can let me know down in the comments. He does the thing where a coin and a key change places. And the gimmick is great. It's like a Chinatown half built into a key. It's a beautiful thing. You literally, you see a coin, 
and it changes into a key. It's so good. And there's so, if you're creative, he goes through the bare basics of it, but if you're creative, you can do so many other things with it. And then my favorite, absolute favorite route, uh, thing that Sankey has ever come up with is paperclip, because paperclip is still the best way to reveal a folded up card. If you're gonna do a Mercury card fold and do a mystery card plot, I love the idea, you don't have to carry a box around with you, you don't have to carry anything else around with you, you can just literally take out this card with a paperclip on it, drop it down on the table, do the whole thing, and at the end, that comes off and it's their selected card. It is brilliant. And the fact that he's done like three DVDs of material now and it's covered pretty much every single way that you could use this slide um, just speaks wonders for how good it is. And that's the thing I like about Sankey. He works with a slight until he literally has nothing else he can do with it. And I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's a Sankey routine because it's got a twirl change and it's got an Erdnase change. But that's an example of really creativity, not just doing a move for one routine and then leaving it, but studying that move and trying to work out all the different ways that you can use that move in so many different ways. And, and that's one of the things I love about Sankey. So yeah, paper clipped is the top, but all the other stuff's really good. Um, yeah, Sankey's great. Okay, so the next question is by Ablo Fluido. Hello again, Ablo Fluido. How you doing? Uh, regular question asker, so thank you very much. Hi, Craig. A question for next time. What are your thoughts on the importance of having cards signed? I heard Matthew Furman say that he doesn't like doing it. I can sort of understand that some magicians seem to spend too much time having spectators sign cards when they could be using that time to do actual magic, but I can see the benefit also. Thoughts? My thoughts are that signed cards are really important if the trick requires a signed card. If it doesn't require a signed card, then there is absolutely no point. So, card, ambitious card. It needs a signed card. If you've worked in the real world long enough, you'll know that when you put that card down in the middle and it comes to the top, if you keep doing it, somebody's gonna think it's a dupe. And even if they don't say it's a duplicate card, there are people that are gonna be thinking that. If you sign the card, that takes the, the, the thoughts of a dupe away. So any single possibility where a dupe can be used, I think that you need to have the card signed. And I talked earlier on on this video about Jay Sankey's paperclip routine. If I very cleanly put a folded up card in a paperclip, then have someone pick a card, have them sign the card, have them put the card back in the deck, hand them the deck, and then I snap my fingers and I pick that card up that's been folded up on the table and I take it out and I have them hand open it and when I do, it's their signed card. If that card is not signed, then they will think there's a duplicate card because it is so impossible. It is absolutely so impossible for that signed card to be the card that they picked that was in the deck a second earlier. You have to have it signed. Card to wallet, I think, has to be signed. Card to pocket, card in the box. Um, uh, you know, mystery card plot has to be signed. There's certain routines that have to be signed. They really do. Now, there are certain routines where people get cards signed that they don't need to be. I saw a routine that we're reviewing in a couple of weeks' time where it was just literally a dealing thing and the cards were being dealt through and they found the card. There's no reason to have that card signed. But that, but if the card is going to an impossible location, it has to be signed. I uh, I do uh, a version of uh, Die Vernon's Travellers, where the four aces are put in the deck and they go into four pockets. And for the longest time, I didn't use a signed card. I didn't have the card signed. And you know what? Here's the best way you can find out how people like your tricks or not. When you finish the show, go into the toilet and sit in the cubicle. And as people are coming out the theatre, they will go into the toilet and they'll discuss your act. And I've always done this to try and get honest feedback about my show. And I remember somebody saying once, oh yeah, he just had aces in his pocket. Uh, that's all it was. Yeah, it's easy. I, I know how he did that one. And at that point, I was like, man, I need to get these aces signed. I don't want people thinking that, especially when I'm working my butt off to actually palm the cards and cop the cards and bottom cop, bottom palm the cards to make sure that that's actually not the case. So yeah, signed cards are very important for certain routines. With regards to the whole dead time thing, all you have to do is be creative and think of ways of dead time. So one thing that I'll do, uh, for example, is um, I, I will have someone, I do Richard Sanders Remarkable, which is the one where the, uh, the Sharpie changes to a selected card. And what I'll do is I'll have someone pick a card if I'm doing an ambitious card, for example, and I'll say, yeah, here's the pen, sign the card for me. Brilliant, while he's signing the card, can you do me a favor? Can you, uh, can you uh, say stop? Brilliant, that's your card. Can you say stop? Brilliant, that's your card. Good, okay, you guys have got card. Oh, you signed the card, brilliant, let's find yours. Look, if I shake it, Sharpie turns into your card. If I shake it again, Sharpie turns into your card. Isn't that amazing? That wasn't even the trick. 
Right, have you got your card? And boom, 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 boom. I'm almost beating them up by magic. Another example is OmniPen by World Magic Shop. My routine on there, I will regularly do um, while someone's signing a card. So I'll have two Sharpie markers. I'll say, here, I'll sign your card. A lot of people ask me why I carry two pens around because I can do this. If I take this pen, it disappears. Go bring it back over there. Put it over there. It jumps down there. Take it, shake it, it disappears. Boom, 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 boom. By the time I've finished, his card signed. I've just shown them 15 moments of magic. So yes, there is dead time. But you need to replace that dead time with something else, which is why I love quick fire routines, especially with Sharpies. But it doesn't have, and Kung Fu, um, Kung Fu Cap is another example that we reviewed on the show recently. Hey, can you uh, sign a card? Hey, by the way, check this out. Look, have a look at this. Isn't that amazing? Or do a quick flurry with the coin. Hey, while he's signing the card, can I borrow that coin? Isn't that weird? If I squeeze, it disappears. It goes back. But look, it's 20 times bigger. Let me throw that coin away. Have you signed the card? So it's all about. Making sure that there is no dead time. If you just go sign a card and then you just sit there going, then that's terrible. But if you kill that, and sometimes you don't need to perform. There are very engaging people that can fill that time just by having a conversation. So you guys having a good meal? You are. Oh, fantastic. What, you, what have you ordered? Oh, the steak. I can totally recommend the steak. The steak is amazing. I love the steak here. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm planning on having the steak later on. And it, what are you having? Are you having, oh, you've got, you got the card, have you? Oh, great. Give me back. Do you see what I mean? So it doesn't have to be a trick, but you learn to fill that dead time. But if that's your only issue with not having a card signed, dude, you need to get those cards signed. Because I promise you, the, the, the effectiveness of the tricks that you're doing will be hired, massively increased if you, uh, if you have the card signed. At least that's my opinion. Okay, so the next question is by Andrew Wiggin. I don't think you've posted before, so thank you very much, Andrew. This is a question. Let's have a look. Um, I've got a question I'd love to hear your thoughts on. For a while now, I've been a hobbyist who's focused exclusively on cards, as well as on difficult techniques. I'm considering starting a move towards professional work and wonder if you think this narrow focus would help or hinder. I've been going to see a lot of the local magicians perform, and 90% of them are using basic stuff that works great for people who have never seen magic before and are very entertaining. They seem to be complete masters of the basics for cards, coins, balls, and a few of the props, but they're not masters of any one thing. I tried to do a full show with nothing but cards, but doing way more advanced stuff would this, uh, would this only be interesting to other magicians and move monkeys? I guess the question is specialist versus general practitioner. What's the ups and downs of each? You know, that's a very thought provoking and interesting question. Um, and you're asking the wrong guy because I love, I just couldn't do just card magic. I really couldn't because magic as, a, as an art form has so much going for it. It really does. There's so many different things you can learn. There's so many different avenues with magic that you can learn. You can learn about comedy magic. You can learn about being serious. There's so many different props that you can spend absolutely ages mastering. And focusing on just one thing, I think that that's going to limit you. Now, that's my opinion anyway. Uh, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, you're right. You know, there's a lot of magicians out there that are jack of all trades and master of none. And they would argue that that works for them because their audiences have never seen magic before. And they want to see, um, you know, they want to see magic. That they're, they're, they're doing the basic stuff and it works for them and that's fine. And so I guess the question is, you know, at the end of the day, yes, you want to be a professional and that's fine. But what do you want your magic to say? What do you want? Because at the end of the day, you have to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't enjoy the tricks that you're performing, then that will eventually be picked up on by the audience, right? You, I, I have dropped tricks in the past that I've fallen out of love with because it's, it's kind of the same with selling. When you sell, um, and I've talked about this on the channel, but when you sell, you've got to be enthusiastic because if you're enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the product that you're selling, then the audience, then the, the person who's buying off you will, will want to buy into that. So if I'm on the phone and I'm trying to sell people, I'm booking me as a close-up magician and I'm like oh yeah let me tell you why I'd be amazing for you but you know I, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and if it's coming across really excited and I'm really enthusiastic that's gonna be a lot better than yeah I'll come along and I'll do some card tricks for people but it's the same with when you're performing if you walk up to a group or you walk up to a table and you're excited about the magic that you're performing and you enjoy it well they'll enjoy it as well but if you're doing stuff just because you feel like you need to do it then they won't enjoy it. So ultimately, yes, it, you know, if you want to be a professional, that's great. 
but you've got to do the type of magic that you enjoy. Now, for me, I like doing the knuckle-busting stuff, especially with coins, but also with cards to a certain degree. I love doing the knuckle-busting stuff. I really do. And, and, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that I can go up and I can do the entire Rune Khan DVD, all of his, all of Curtis Cam stuff. I can do most stuff with coins. And I do do it because I don't just want to learn it to uh, perform it to YouTube. I want to do it in the real world because ultimately... I'm a performer, so I want to actually show people this stuff. Um, and I love doing really complicated coin magic. So I'll do really complicated coin magic, but I'm not just going to go out and do that and that alone at a gig. You know, I, I, I run an entertainment agency, as you know, and I get a lot of people calling me up and saying, oh, you're not just going to do card tricks, are you? The amount of times I get people phoning me up going... You're not going to do the same stuff as everyone else. Can you be a little bit different? What stuff are you going to do? So you want to try and vary it up. If you want to get lots and lots of bookings, you want to try and vary it up. You know what I would do is I would look at somebody like Francis Minotti. I would look at somebody like Francis Minotti because what he does is he is so creative. He takes existing plots and he's very creative about what he does with it, right? Um, and if you've never seen his DVD, you really should do because it's like, the you know, he, do, he does this egg bag routine where the phone rings and his mom's calling him and then the phone ends up in the egg bag. He's doing this thing where he's shot dead at the end and he's lying on the floor dead. There's so much stuff he does. He does a needle swallowing routine with an x-ray machine so you can say, oh, just genius stuff and you can tell that he's just really enjoying coming up with these crazy weird out to lunch routines and so that's what you need to do a you need to make sure that you're enjoying it but b i would try and vary it up a bit now there's nothing wrong with with doing the complicated sleight of hand stuff with cards but you know i'm sure you've been there and if you haven't you will do when you go up to a complete stranger and so pick a card and they go i've seen this one before because they just assume that every magician knows the same 10 tricks they don't say that when you make a coin appear in thin air or when you solve a Rubik's Cube or you pull a Rubik's Cube out of the air, whatever it may be. But when you take a pack of cards out and say, pick a card, there are people out there that go, oh, I've seen that one. Now, for everybody that's saying that, imagine how many people are thinking it. So I think you're limiting yourself if you just do card magic. But if you don't like the idea of doing the Bob basic simple stuff, then take another prop and just master it. Take the sponge balls and don't do the same sponge ball routine that everyone does, but get really creative with it. Do stuff with sponge balls that has never been seen before. Apply sponge balls to something else. Look at Benson Burner by Tom Stone, making all those sponge balls appear. You know, people wouldn't look at that and go, I've seen that before. So if you want to take it, if you enjoy doing the complicated stuff with cards, then apply that to another prop as well and really immerse yourself in it. But I think you're limiting yourself if you just do card magic. I hope that helps. But if you want more clarification, let me know in the comments down below. Okay, so the next question is by Stevie Selsamu. Say, Stevie, how are you doing? I have a question. Okay, cool. How do you deal with embarrassment and being in the limelight performing magic? It's a catch-22 as I love magic and I don't want to ever give up, but I'm naturally an introvert and performing is the hardest thing for me to crack. You know what? You should watch the Nate Cranzo interview that I went up on Tuesday. I don't know if you've seen it. If you haven't, stop what you're doing and watch this because he talks about exactly the same thing. He talks about being an introvert and, and, and he talks about having to switch it on. And a lot of the time you have to. If you Look, the ultimate bottom line is if you want to be a performer, then you have to ultimately go out and perform in front of people. And if you're naturally an introvert, and I am, I know it sounds weird because I'm on video all the time and I, I perform and do kid shows and close up and stage and illusion shows and everything. But you know what? Here's the thing. And this is kind of I'm, Sarah will tell you this, right? My wife will tell you this. I hide behind the magic. Uh, and what I mean by that is if she takes me to a party and all of those people don't know I'm a magician, I will literally just not talk to anybody. I find it really awkward going up and speaking to anyone. I'm, I'm very kind of, not nervous, that's the wrong word, but I'm very, I don't want to say antisocial, but that's kind of what it is. I don't like going up to people. Now, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, how you doing? I'd have a conversation with them, but I'm not very good at approaching new people. Now, you put me in a gig with a pack of cards and some coins, and you say my job is to go over and light this room up and get people to join in. I'll do that. I'm like, hey, how you doing? My name's Craig. I'm the magician. But it's because I'm kind of have a role there, have a job there, and I hide behind the magic. I don't do that 
when I'm at a party, I can't hide behind the match. I can't go and go, hey, my name's Craig. I'm Sarah's husband. I'd like to show you a card trick. Would you? It'd be weird, right? So I'm kind of almost lost. So I do know where you're coming from. And I think a lot of other magicians know where you're coming from at all as well. I think magic attracts people that are naturally shy, socially inept. I'm not saying you're socially inept, by the way, but I am. I think, it apl I think it attracts people like that because all of a sudden, if you're this guy, and I was like that at school. At school, I wasn't the most popular kid. I had a couple of kids to hang around with, but I was not the most popular kid in school. Far from it. And, and, and magic allowed me to do something that everybody found fascinating. Oh my God, suddenly people were giving me attention, right? Oh my God, this is amazing. So that's one of the attractions for me to magic. And I think it does. Magic attracts people that are shy because it allows you to almost have these superhero-like powers. Um, ultimately, if you want to be a performer and you want to go out there and you want to perform to people and you want to showcase what you can do, whether it be as a hobbyist or a professional or a semi-professional, you have to learn to go out and perform. And the way to get past that is to just go out and do it. You have to be able to push past the nerves, put yourself out of your comfort zone and, and, and still go out and do the best job that you can do. And I still get nervous now. I still get nervous now. Just before lockdown, there was this gig and there were like 4,000 people in the audience and I was doing the warm-up act for 20 minutes. And I was like, oh my God, I'm really nervous about this. I was st stage right and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Uh, it still happens, but you know what? Nerves are good. Because when people see that you're, ner when you're nervous about something, it means that you care. If you weren't nervous, my friend, it means that you don't care right? Because if you didn't care about what happened when you went out and performed to that group of people, if you didn't care, then you wouldn't be nervous. You wouldn't give a crap. You wouldn't, you wouldn't care. I'm not nervous. I don't care. You just walk out and you do it. But the fact that you're nervous means you care. You care about something. You either care about how they perceive you. They care about how you perceive the magic. You care about something. And so that's a good thing, right? And what you have to do is you just have to get past it. And the only way, and I'm really sorry that I have to be the guy to tell you this, the only way to get past this is to grow a set of balls and just go out there and do it. And understand that you're gonna die in your ass. You are gonna die in your ass when you start doing close up and you start doing close up professionally and you go into a restaurant, you're gonna die in your ass. You're gonna go over to a table, you're gonna drop the cards, you're gonna do terrible, it's gonna be awful, people are gonna hate you. You have to get past that because you can't, you can't skip the steps. You can't be a Las Vegas headliner, for example, just by buying a magic set and then the next day headlining Vegas. You have to go through all of these steps. You have to go through all of the shit to get the success. It's just as simple as that. And it's the same with working on stage. I have died on my ass every single, many times, many times I've died on, I've died on my ass on stage in front of a lot of people. And there is nothing worse then standing on stage, I remember going to Newcastle once and I was billed as a motivational magician and I went out to do some magic and nobody listened to me. They'd been drinking, it was 11 o'clock at night, nobody cared, nobody cared. And I remember just like walking off stage completely dejected. And, and it happens, it can happen. But here's the thing, you have to use it as a learning experience. Every single time I've died on stage, I have learned something. I have learned something and I have made sure that I don't do it again. Why? And here's the thing. You have to accept that everything, in, in when it comes to performance, everything is your fault. I remember when I first started, I was terrible. I was terrible. And I remember the first time I, uh, and I'll tell you this story. I've never told this on camera before. I'll tell you a story about the first time I went to a gig. So I went to this gig, right? And I was booked to do a comedy club. Uh, and, and I don't know how they found my phone number. It was, I'd only just kind of become a professional magician. I was mainly going out working kids' parties and stuff like that. I'd done the odd restaurant. And, uh, and they rang up and they were like, um, oh, we're a comedy club. Can you, can, you, can you come and perform? I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but we want you to be the headlining act. No problem. I can do that. Um, and so I, I put this act together. I didn't have a stage act, but I put this act together and I went up and they billed me as being the headlining act on both halves. So uh, I had to do half an hour at the end of the first half, half an hour at the end of the second half. 
So uh, I did the first half and man, I died, right? I was there with a friend of mine. He, we were doing the act together. He's an ex-business partner. And we were doing this trick, right? And the trick was uh, using like a... Um, a, 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 a uh, remote viewing board. So he had a, a clipboard with a piece of paper and, uh, and, and, and my friend was backstage, his name was Russell, my friend was backstage and he had a little computer thing and he could see the, uh, what the guy was writing, right? And so I had this idea for a lottery prediction. And I was like, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the guy, I'm gonna go out with some, uh, I'm gonna get the guy to write down six lottery numbers. And, um, uh, and, and then the idea was my friend was there backstage, Russell was there backstage with all of these balls, a set of balls uh, that we got and a change bag. And as this guy was writing down the lottery numbers, Russell was just taking the balls and putting them in one side of the change bag. So then I could go, I could get him to bring this bag out, get someone else to pull some balls out and they matched exactly. That was the plan. That was the plan. Never performed it, never scripted it. I was like, wing it, it'd be fine. So I went on stage, right? And uh, it was going badly from the start. It was going badly from the start, but we hadn't rehearsed it. So I, um, I had this guy uh, writing down numbers and then I turned around to Russell, I turned around to the wings and I was like, Russell, can you bring out the balls? And he was like, no. I'm like, what do you mean no? What do you mean no? I knew that he had the balls, he was sitting right next to them. I was like, Russell, bring me out the balls. He's like, no, I can't find them. I'm like, what do you mean you can't find them? So I looked over at the wings and there's Russell doing this. And, and I kind of clocked that it didn't work, so he didn't have the information. And I, I, I never worked on stage before. I hadn't planned this. I didn't have an out. So I just said the first thing that came into my head. I said, have you tried the car? This is in front of an audience that is wondering what the hell is going on. Have you tried looking in the car? And he just shouted back going, I don't think that's going to help. I'm like, um... I kind of realized that I needed to get these numbers written down again. So I reset the kind of the clipboard and he'd taken the piece of paper and folded it up and he was holding onto it. I was like, give me the piece of paper. And I was like, right, I have not looked at these. And as I said that, I flicked it open. I was like, oh, oh, I've looked at them. We're gonna have to write them down again. No, that was my excuse. At this point, the audience hated me. So I was like, I'll write them down again. And he wrote down these numbers and I heard Russell go, yes. So that told me it worked. And then we did the routine. And the problem was he got bored at that point and he wrote one, two, three, four, five, six. So when somebody else was pulling out the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, it died on my ass. The guy that actually planned the event, he came up to me and he said, uh, you know, in the second half, we don't want you to do half an hour at the end. Just do five minutes at the beginning. Is that okay? Can you just do five minutes at the beginning? We think that's better. I was like, yeah, I know what you're trying to say. Oh, this is awful. When driving, driving back, I remember turning around to Russell and going, well, that was a terrible audience. And I remember going back home to my wife, Sarah, and she was like, how's it, how is it? I was like, oh, it was terrible, there were a terrible audience. Anyway, about two weeks later, I did another gig. I was like, oh, that was a terrible audience. Uh, I, I died on my ass probably about five gigs in a row. And every single time I went back to Sarah and said, this is a terrible audience. And she turned around to me and she said, the voice of wisdom, as my wife is, she said, no dummy, it's not the audience, it's you. Uh, and at that point, I realized that everything, in, 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 when it comes to performance, everything is your fault. If you're happy with your performance and you've gone out and you've smashed it and you have done an amazing job and everyone loves you, well done, kudos, good job for you. That is your fault. If, however, you've died on your ass and the audience has hated you, that is your fault as well. When you point a finger at somebody, there are three fingers pointing back at you. And you have to remember that. So you have to go out and you have to die on your ass and you have to learn from the experience and you have to get better. And every single time you go in and die on your ass, you'll get better. I did holiday parks for many, many years as a stage magician. Died on my ass, got better. Died on my ass, got better. I very rarely die on my ass now. I normally go out and absolutely smash it because I've gone through the shit to get to where I am now. And that's ultimately, and look, I'm, there's going to be people that are going to be listening to this right now and they are not going to be doing magic in 10 years time. They are, I guarantee you there's somebody sitting here right now watching this video that is desperate to be a professional magician and in 10 years time they will be doing something else, probably something they enjoy, maybe something they don't, but they will have dropped out of magic, they won't be holding a deck of cards, they won't be getting anyone to pick a pack of cards, and if someone goes, oh, weren't you into magic a few years ago? Oh yeah, I haven't picked a pack of cards in years, because they won't be prepared to go through the shit that they need to go through in order to be successful. Now there are gonna be people watching this video as well that will be, in 10 years time, much better than me, much better than a million other magicians, they'll probably be on TV, they'll probably be smashing it all around the world. If you want that to be you, you gotta A, 
Grow a set of balls. B, learn from your mistakes. C, don't be afraid to die in your ass. E, don't know. <laughs> you got to make sure that you remember that nerves are good and never give up. That's the best advice I can give you. Hope it helps. Right, so that's it, guys. That is another Q&A, as Ryland would say, in the bag. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. There was a question, by the way, about peak wallets from uh, somebody, don't know who, uh, from Phil K 77 uh, I'm going to be answering that on a video in the next week or two because I've got a great video idea for Peak Wallets. So uh, I apologise for not answering your question, but I'm going to be answering it in spades very soon. But guys, let me know in the comments what you think of the video. Let me know down below. Please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel. It really helps. And I will be back tomorrow with another 5x5. I've got an amazing 5x5 next, uh, tomorrow and I have a special guest. It's the performing nerd, Tom Crosby on 5x5 five five tomorrow. So check it out. Thanks very much for watching. You guys are awesome. My name's Craig from Magic TV.